From land girls to girl power, we mark International Women's Day with the first in a brand new series charting the rise of post-war feminism. Back to the 1970s now for acclaimed filmmaker Vanessa Engel's look at sexual politics and the role of women. Feminism is my religion. I wouldn't know how to think without it. Did you call it patriarchy? Did you call it capitalism? What was, what was the problem? We just uh, sort of said it was men. <laughs> In the late 1960s, women in Britain and America began to fight for women's liberation. This political struggle resulted in the fastest and most significant transformation in women's lives there has ever been. Good. <laughs> you see, I am woman. I Women from very different backgrounds came together in a wave of activism, hoping to put an end to their oppression. Their sense of solidarity and shared purpose lasted a decade. Glad you dropped in. Amazing, isn't it? Look at that. And she did the washing and ironing today for a family of five. Can you describe for me what the situation was like for women in America in the 1950s? How constrained were your choices as a woman? Well, they were totally constrained when it came to uh, anything in the outside world. In those days, jobs were listed by sex. And the only jobs available to women were secretary or clerk, sales clerk or file clerk. And I had a college degree, and I was a very, very bright student. And it made absolutely no difference. Not one of my professors even thought of helping me. They expected me to get married, so I did. I really didn't know what else to do. Can you tell me how old you were when you were married? I was 20. And then I had the children when I was 25 and 26. And did you enjoy all that drudgery? I didn't mind it. What I minded was being limited to it. People used to bill and coo but that don't make it with you Cause there's other things oh. we do In our time, baby In our time, yeah In our time, baby In our time It was considered unnatural for a woman to want to have a career. That was considered a manly aspiration. So women thought something was wrong with them for wanting to have meaningful work. And uh, I think that a lot of women uh, resolved it by uh, becoming um, uh, very insecure, embittered, uh, extremely neurotic, you know, because they couldn't uh, fulfill themselves. You were 33 in 1968, so how come you weren't already married with a couple of kids? Um, I think men thought I was a bad bet. I think they knew <laughs> that I had my own ambitions and I did want to write books. 
Uh, I couldn't deny that. But were you under pressure? Was your family expecting you to just settle down? <laughs> no, I think they, they thought that I might be unmarriageable. <laughs> I resisted feeling like an unnatural woman because I wanted uh, to, to have a career. But it was something that I think all women then kept very private. They didn't talk about it publicly because they were half convinced that, <laughs> that something was wrong, that we shouldn't be thinking these thoughts. We should find our total satisfaction in uh, marriage and motherhood. In 1969, you were married, you had two children, you had a degree. So you kind of achieved everything that a woman was supposed to have achieved by then, probably? Yes, I suppose so. Um, and like many women at the time, uh, I found this strangely unsatisfying. Uh, and that was one of the reasons for the birth of the women's movement then, I think. It, it is a wonderful thing to have children. Um, and to be in the position of, uh, you know, enjoying them and looking after them and so on. But it is, along with that, in this culture goes, or went then, certainly, the expectation that you would spend a lot of time cleaning lavatories, cooking meals, looking after husbands, being, providing a general kind of domestic and caring role for everybody else. And that actually has nothing to do with motherhood as such. And it was this contradiction that um, I think that a lot of the early women's liberationists in this country were drawing attention to. The feminists who are here tonight, do you not believe a woman's place is in the home, right? Of course not. It's, it's a very oppressive concept. It's right. being used to oppress women and to make them think they're lucky to be slaves. How many women in the home are slaves? All women are slaves, oh. yeah. The movement seemed to appear out of nowhere. And I can remember um, people on the left saying, you know, where did you recruit them? As Mrs. Panker said, enough, enough. Change the railing, she would do a stuff. Nowadays, a woman out for justice. But when the news got out, even when it was hostile coverage, women were attracted because it somehow struck a chord. We want equality. We want equality. This is no feminine equality. We'd like some recognition for our status. We weren't put on this earth to peel potatoes. It was, you know, small group five or six of us, and that was 70 or 71. And what did you do in your small group? Talked. Very exhausting it was. We talked about our, our lives and our experiences as women, and the central element uh, in this was discovering that all these feelings and thoughts that you had, that you thought were just your own individual thoughts, experiences, and there was something wrong with you, everybody else in the group had them too. We would start with things uh, that were um, kind of tiny, but not so tiny, like, why do we smile so much? Why do we try to be so appealing? Why are we so afraid to show our anger? Why is anger considered not feminine? There was always something to discuss. We kept at it. I was in a group which was a rather swatty group, actually, because we... Anyway, we all sat down and read Engels. Then we read Simone de Beauvoir, and so we read things and discussed them, and then we... Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome one of America's leading feminists and novelists, Ma Marilyn French. <laughs> Can I ask you first what your definition is of a feminist? Well, I think there are different kinds of feminists. I think the basic definition I would use is any person, female or male, 
who does not believe in male supremacy is a feminist. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a very good answer. Yeah. I think there are many branches within that. There are things that I distinguish. For instance, I distinguish political feminism from philosophical feminism. Mm -hmm. um, How did you become one of the, the, as they call you, the major exponents of day-to-day -day feminism? Because you're not a militant or a political feminist, really, I'm extremely you? political. You are? Oh. But uh, in my feelings, I, yes. I don't. I'm not a pol political person. I'm a writer who requires silence and solitude. I oppose male privilege. I oppose the idea that men are superior to women. I don't think men should have privilege of any kind over women. In my life, as I have lived it, as I have seen it around me, it is the women who worry about the children. It is the women who keep the family going. It is the women who have kept the world going while men are off killing each other and a lot of us along the way. I'm sick of it. I've always been sick of it. Marilyn French's novel, The Women's Room, was the highly autobiographical story of a woman who revolts against the constraints of domesticity. Written in the 1960s, it took many years to find a publisher, but went on to sell 20 million copies worldwide. I was telling the truth about women's lives in a way it had never been told. Because novels about women do not tell the truth. They don't tell the truth about the place of what housework is in a woman's life. They don't tell the truth about what it feels like to be prey, to be always sub subordinate. They just don't. And they always focus on men, as though a man is going to save you. No man is going to save you from this. A woman's lot is to give and give and go on giving. A woman's got to love and How did you account for women's subordination? What was your explanation for why women were oppressed? We thought it was a mixture of um, men and capitalism. It seemed to me that if you were going to change women's position, you needed to change the society. I consider this solution to exploitation and oppression to be communism, despite the hollow resonance the word has acquired. It seems to me that the cultural and economic liberation of women is inseparable from the creation of a society in which all people no longer have their lives stolen from them. Before she was a feminist, Sheila Robotham was a socialist. When she joined the women's liberation movement, she brought her left-wing principles with her and always believed that female emancipation would only come about if working-class women were politicised too. I thought the working class was the key to change. But as a middle-class educated woman yourself, why did that seem the place to go to mobilise? It seemed important that women's liberation wasn't only middle-class women in London. And I say, and I say to all of you, get out and fight now and show them that we're not the fragile little things we once were and they think we still are. Well, my next guest is a young wife, soon to be a mother, she is an editor with a New York publishing company and as an active member of the women's uh, liberation movement, she feels that women haven't come far enough, baby. So would you welcome, please, Robin Morgan. Robin? I think that uh, Miss 
uh, Morgan has forgotten that uh, for a woman, there's great dignity in just being a woman. I think that Mr. Ford has maybe forgotten that for a human being, there's great dignity in just being a human being. Well, why can't you be a human being and a woman too? Well, that's what we want to try, you know? We've never really been allowed to. Miss Illinois is Miss America. We are going to sing your song. It was Robin Morgan in 1968 who organized Women's Liberation's very first public protest, a demonstration against the beauty pageant Miss America. In 1970, another group of activists decided to organize a sit-in that would similarly challenge existing social stereotypes of women. Susan Brown Miller was by now devoting herself full-time to feminist activism, and she led the demonstration. We were occupying a ladies' magazine, a women's magazine, edited by a man, as most of them were in those days. Do you feel that Ladies' Home Journal, being geared to a specific type of woman, is representative of the American way of life for the average woman in this country? Yes, I do. Would you elaborate on that, please? No. They were feeding women propaganda that was against women's interests. And it was successful. Uh, yes, at the end of 11 hours, John Mac Carter, uh, the editor-in-chief, uh, agreed that he would give us eight pages of the magazine uh, in the August issue, and we would uh, write the content, and they wouldn't change our content. Yeah. Anybody want to sign a copy of the Journal? Anyone want to sign a copy of the female eunuch? Germaine Greer was born in a bush, so the flyleaf of her book says. Germaine Greer shot to fame in both Britain and America when she published The Female Eunuch in 1970. The book argued that women were, as she put it, castrated because they were conditioned to be so completely passive in relation to their own sexuality. Greer encouraged women to rediscover their authentic sexual appetites in order to free themselves as human beings. I've never seen any definition which re refers to women when you come to eunuch. It's always a man who's castrated. It's impossible to castrate a woman, at least as far as the definition is concerned, in a dictionary. It's only impossible to castrate a woman because it's assumed that she has no sex from the outset, because she's assumed to be a castrated thing from the outset. I mean, I didn't castrate women. Freud did. I mean, he's the first one to talk about the castration complex. I didn't invent that. But I To put women in touch with the idea that they had the right to want things and to go and get them. People are always turning on me and saying, why do you want to upset all these young housewives who are happy having their babies and blah, blah, blah. And I have to say, look, I don't want to upset all these happy young housewives. There are thousands upon thousands, millions of other women who are not in the least happy and who are yelling for help. For activists, however, sisterhood was thriving. Not only were women engaging in successful protests and demonstrations, but feminist intellectuals were also looking at how society came to be organized along such sexist lines. Anne Oakley had given up full-time motherhood to become a social scientist. What was striking, particularly striking to me then, was reading a lot of anthropological studies, how tremendously variable all these definitions of masculinity and femininity are. So the idea that women have to do the housework uh, you know, men have to go out and go to work because they hunt the animals. This is all a huge. Um, it's not just an oversimplification, it's actually a myth. 
Oakley's research showed that masculine and feminine attributes were a result of social conditioning. She was the first person to insist that although sex might be determined by biology, gender is not. This was an entirely new concept. OK, so I'm going to ask some really basic questions. What is my sex? I think you're probably female. And what's my gender? I don't know you well enough to say that. <laughs> From the evidence that you are aware of, is anything set by biology other than kind of how our bodies function? I think very little. Three political statements point the way to the liberation of housewives. The housewife role must be abolished, the family must be abolished, gender roles must be abolished. The housewife role must be abolished, the family must be abolished, gender roles must be abolished. Really see that the family was something that I wanted to hang on to. The problem was that we didn't think through, it was quite, how else did you bring up children? If it were admitted that the family is maintained at the expense of women, capitalism would have to devise some other way of getting the work done. You're my photogenic model From the glossy magazine In among your kitchen structure Soapy water washing machine there was a young lady of Wapping whose life was all cleaning and shopping. Her husband said jokily, try reading Anne Oakley, and she did, and left home without stopping. Also from the early 70s, there was very much a movement about women taking control of their own bodies. The slogan was first raised uh, in the pro... Uh, uh, abortion movement, our bodies belong to ourselves, which... Uh... Secretaries, working women and wives, we must control our bodies to control our lives. If we have children, we want them to be planned. What we want is abortion, abortion on demand. And... Not only did women want to control their own bodies, they also wanted to live without the threat of male violence. We're continuously the victims of violence, murder, rape, uh, you know, corrupting children. Or and just so being beaten up. Or being or beaten. beaten. Or physically threatened. And we're always physically threatened, you know, like we're, we're threatened and even, you know, we're so liberated we go out at night wherever we want to, but it isn't another woman who's going to hit us on the head, who's going to rape us or knife us or kill us. There is no question that men are predatory on women. Women are prey. They start to be prey when they're 8 or 10 or 11 years old. I mean, women are frightened when they walk on a city street or any street at night. They're frightened of any man at all. He may not be a danger, but he may. We know we are prey, and that's a horrible knowledge to live with about your own species. Rape is, rape is nothing more or less than a conscious process of intimidation by which all men keep all women in a state of fear. All men, all men keep all women in a state of fear. It doesn't mean that some people wanted <laughs> wanted me to, to say I believe, which would have been ridiculous, that all men rape. All men don't rape. Those who do keep the rest of us all in a state of fear. Susan Brown Miller spent five years researching and writing a history of rape. Her classic feminist book, Against Our Will, was published in 1975. It was the first book to identify rape as an expression of male power rather than as an isolated sexual act. All women are lesbians, except those who don't know it naturally. They are, but don't know it yet. I am a woman and therefore a lesbian. I am a woman who is a lesbian because I am a woman and a woman who loves herself naturally.
Within the women's movement, there was a discussion, quite a heated discussion, I think, about um, whether or not women should adopt lesbianism as a political identity. Was that something you ever considered or tried? Oh, yeah, I thought about it. But um, it seemed to me fairly pointless to do something that you didn't particularly want to do for the sake of political correctness. So you never gave it a go, Anne? I never gave it a go. Except on an emotional level. You know, so a lot of people did try to see if it was a fit, you know? Uh, and for some it was, and it was where they should have been all along, and for others it wasn't. Till all women are lesbians, there will be no true political revolution. As feminists, what we believe in is very simple, and that is the social, economic, and political equality of the sexes. Now, therefore, we are in politics, you see, because... How do you feel about having sexual relationships with men? Well, I was married to a man for ten years and adored him. So. I mean today. Now. No, I think it's women for me now, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. That's one of the controversial positions you've taken, of course. And I don't well, mean to say Well, it is indeed. It yeah. certainly is. Yeah. We're at the end of a period of masculine rule, quite harsh at times. What's going to happen um, to them? They're going to become drones in this society? Well, oh, you, do you either have to run things or not? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think rather. we're entering on a, on a period where the sexes will be in an egalitarian footing, which they perhaps once were. Aren't you doing um, some damage to the family when you move in that direction? Well, if you, if you posit a sort of patriarchal authoritarian family, sure. I certainly believe that if you tell the truth of women's lives, that women's lives have to improve. So that we were really riding high. We thought we were changing the world. It was so great, but it ended. By the late 70s, the women's movement had made very significant gains. Across the Western world, women had achieved equal rights and legislative change in many areas of their lives. We, we have come a long way. Things have changed a huge amount. But we haven't had a revolution. When I run into people now who, you know, say, oh, my goodness, uh, they were active in the 60s, and then they say, look at you, you're still going. How can you still be, you know, doing that? And I, I don't know what to answer them. I want to say, how can you not? Is, you know, is the world okay, okie dokie now? Women are still oppressed. There is still a lot of work to be done. And it's more difficult now that feminism is a dirty word. And feminism is a dirty word. And it's more difficult now that feminism is a dirty word. And now that most people believe that there, there are no battles to fight anymore. There's so much more that needs to be changed. And the new generation is going to have to learn that you can only do it, really, by having a movement. And they're also going to learn, and it's a, a sad lesson, that you can't jumpstart a movement. You know, you know, suddenly there's a critical mass of people who feel like they want to do something, along with, with you know, other people. Good. We've done your dirty washing.